Let me ask you a question. How far would you be willing to go to overcome your own personal issues and find new appreciation for the life that you have? Would you be willing to... die? No? Oh, um, okay. How would you feel about facing a series of challenges meant to emotionally open you up to the idea of changing with a cast of cartoony, potentially off-putting sidekicks? And also, you could die if you don't have the will to change. Look, I know I just described a saw trap, but don't worry. We're not gonna be going as far as elongated, disturbing on-screen deaths in this video. Okay, I lied. I don't understand why you people trust me. But what did I just show you? Well, to answer that in as indirect and frustrating a way as possible, the way that I prefer on this channel, do you guys remember when Cartoon Network would post shorts on their YouTube channel and website that were very obviously backdoor pilots for series they wanted to gauge interest in? Who could forget Jammers, Bottoms Butte, Riding with Burgess? Yeah, a lot of this stuff was completely incomprehensible or seriously hit and miss. It's not exactly a mystery why executives would be a bit skeptical about them. But it was an interesting experiment nonetheless, basically allowing for viewers to decide what might get a shot at being a series based on reception. And there was some worthwhile content that materialized into regular show, Over the Garden Wall, We Bear Bears, and possibly my favorite of the batch that got picked up, Victor and Valentino. The poor man's gravity falls. Oh, and there was also... But before that, while we're on the topic of Infinity, how about I let you in on the near infinite vehicle choices over several distinct time periods you can pick from in this video's sponsor, War Thunder. A free multiplayer game available for Xbox, PlayStation, PC, and Mac about fighting military battles using a mix of aircrafts, ships, and ground vehicles. Complete with constantly improving visuals to make the experience as realistic as possible, advanced graphics and physics to simulate fighting in the field, a wide, ever-expanding range of detailed locations from across the globe to choose from, vehicles encompassing 10 distinct military forces from the 20th century to now with tons of customization options, and if you don't want to just play one mode of transport at a time, War Thunder has the unique ability to let you incorporate multiple types of vehicles at once during a fight. And don't think I forgot any of you longtime players either. Seeing as it's had some of the highest active player counts on Steam, it has to keep old fans interested with constant new material, and right now it's an update called Sky Guardians, adding the Yak 141 vertical Takeoff Fighter, the Panzer 1S SPAAG, the Little Bird Helicopter, Warships of the French Fleet, and a whole new map for aircraft fights, Pyrenees. So whether you're old or new, there's plenty of reason to download War Thunder for free. And if you follow my link in the description, any new players, or ones that have been logged out for over six months, will get half a million Silver Lions, a week of renting legendary German ground vehicles, three premium vehicles as a permanent gift, XP boosters, a week of premium accounts, and other bonuses. That's a lot to be given out for nothing. So hurry up and get it before it comes to an end by checking out my link in the description. Thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring, and on with the video. Created by Owen Dennis, a storyboard artist for regular show and not much else. Infinity Train started out as a short he created from the idea of waking up in an unsettling place, expanding it from there into the concept of a train with infinite cars that people are taken to when they need it most, getting numbers on their hands that represent how far they need to go before they can make it back home. To which I say, yeah, of course this was created by somebody that worked on regular show, no fucking shit. But I don't just say that because of the nightmare-inducing, deathly imagery for children I just gave you a taste of, that's only superficial. Really, it goes way deeper than that and relates back to what both of the series are when stripped down to their bare essentials, which are way more similar than you think. Though I do know how dumb that sounds from an outsider's perspective. After all, when looking at regular show in comparison to Infinity Train, the two seem nothing alike. One is an episodic comedy about two slacker friends making it through their day-to-day -day lives at a park, the other is a linear mystery series with hints of comedy focused initially on an intuitive 12-year-old girl and her struggle of figuring out how to escape. But the two ultimately have one thing in common that ties them together, their usage of completely off-the-wall settings and scenarios to help the cast creatively deal with their interpersonal problems. Like, I know regular show has sort of gotten this reputation for having episodes that go like, Mordecai says basketball sucks, semicolon, the king of basketball comes down from the moon to fight him. But a majority of the 
the time, there is a deeper meaning to the conflict of any given episode, and once it's over, the characters are generally better off for it. Which I think definitely contributed to why people were intrigued by Infinity Train's pilot. It gave us some familiar mechanics to draw assumptions and ideas from about where a full-blown series could go, but it distinguished itself as unique through a strong mystery element and fun, original characters to come along with. You could just tell there was way more to be explored, unlike a lot of other CN shorts that felt self-contained and hard to imagine as anything more. So with enough fan outcry, three years after the pilot became the studio's most popular short, Infinity Train got a full release in 2019 as a 10-episode miniseries that, thanks to its popularity, was followed closely behind by a series of continuations with new sets of characters in the same universe, making it not only a mature, serialized mystery cartoon with, well, infinite possibilities for setting and story potential, drawing on real emotions and turmoil to keep it feeling down to earth, but also an anthology. So you should already be able to guess that it got cancelled too soon for a stupid reason, and eventually it got so mistreated by the people at HBO Max as one of their originals, they removed it from the platform for pretty much no reason and made it impossible to legally watch in high quality. Ugh. Real life gets me so depressed sometimes. But I'm not gonna let it detract from what Infinity Train was, nor am I gonna let people forget about the series anytime soon when it did so much to prove it was worth remembering despite each season's honestly tiny runtime. An hour and 40 minutes per season might not sound like a lot, damn it, but there's more than enough material for me to make some kind of video about it. So let's reminisce on what we were lucky enough to get from this show before it was taken too soon. This is Infinity Train, a surprisingly finite retrospective. But a pretty long title, I might have to work on that. When it comes to setting the groundwork for an anthology series, where each story moving forward is going to be different and focus on a near entirely separate cast of characters from the previous one, the first thought that comes to the mind of any creator should probably go along the lines of, how do I start? Seeing as it's important to set the status quo in the first story or two, so the audience can get a better understanding of what's to come, and possibly, what could be subverted in the future. Think of the Twilight Zone. It's best known for creating creepy situations and unsettling moments from simple ideas that may or may not even be happening. And that's conveyed well in the first episode, Where Is Everybody? Which also lets us know that stories will often have an unforeseen twist or some kind of commentary on the world at large. There are these consistent narrative threads that pop up again and again to help identify a story as part of the universe, keeping in tone with the series' themes. And for Infinity Train, the main connective theme should be pretty obvious. Each season is going to deal with a different group on the train, led by a passenger, slowly coming to terms with what it is they need to to learn about themselves so they can get home. And though that basic formula is going to be deconstructed over the next few seasons, like I said, the first is about setting the baseline for what should be expected, and IT does a great job doing just that by showing us the average passenger experience. Same as it was in the pilot, our first major protagonist is Tulip, a 12-year-old intellectual girl from Wisconsin that's unable to go to a game design camp she was really excited for due to her parents being disorganized after their divorce. A shift in her family dynamic that's very clearly beneficial affecting her, but from what we see in the first episode, she isn't willing to talk about it with anyone. So with this event as sort of the last straw, she tries going to camp on her own but finds the train, thinking it'll take her where she needs to go. And honestly, I love this introduction to her character purely for how well it sets up not only what she's like, but also what she's going through in such a natural way. Lots of kids have to deal with divorces after all, and often, attempts at portraying it aren't communicated properly, such as the infamous band Sesame Street episode hilariously titled, Snuffy's Parents Get a Divorce. So having such a complex situation be the central conflict of a series lead is pretty bold. And what's even more impressive is that the show doesn't treat it like a singular event Tulip needs to overcome. It's something that's also worse in negative aspects of her personality, causing subsequent issues to pop up. So with that in mind, she not only needs to figure out why the divorce happened and accept it, but also address the other problems it's created. And the train gets her to finally do both of those things through her denizen companions, a dual personality robot looking for his mother one one and a royal talking Corgi Atticus, who are sort of tailor-made to put Tulip in scenarios that force her to confront the way she is, as they're carefree, simple, willing to slow down for the sake of fun, and immediately put themselves in harm's way for the sake of friends. All things Tulip doesn't take to at first being a super logical person that likes making immediate progress by herself and gets incredibly frustrated if she doesn't. However, slowly but surely, with the duo there to guide her, Tulip lowers that exterior to acknowledge how she's acted to cope with the divorce. She starts 
letting herself slow down to take everything in and understand nothing is as black and white as she wants it to be. So by the time she reaches the car that shows happy versions of experiences with her parents, appealing to the fictional reality she wanted that matches how she once preferred to remember them, Tulip is able to see beyond and recognize that while she wanted her parents to be happy and saw the divorce as a massive shock for that reason, thinking it went against her logical analysis, in reality, the signs were always there. She just didn't want to see them and chose to run away from the issue, making it her responsibility to bear rather than one that could be solved by talking everything out. It's a stellar way of writing tweens going through that kind of process, as at that age, it really is common for children to blame themselves, believing it was somehow their fault and the divorce could be fixed if they just found a way to be better, but... A lot of the time, it isn't anyone's fault. Sometimes, it's out of any singular person's control, and you need to accept that the world you wanted isn't able to be repaired or you'll only end up hurting yourself. As we see through the dichotomy Tulip has with the antagonist of the season, Amelia, a former passenger that chose to take over the train from its initial conductor, who turns out to be one one, so she could recreate the life she once had through cars representing her life. But really, all she was doing was elongating her pain, holding on to a future she could never have for decades on end. She's a sad reflection of what Tulip could have become if she never had anyone to keep her grounded like Atticus and one one did, sinking into her own despair, assuming she could fix a problem out of her control. But she can't, and Tulip gets her to realize that, giving us the hope that Amelia might change too, despite all she's done, and atone for the wrongs that have caused her number to grow as high as it has. But she's also not the focus of the next season, if that's what you were thinking. Though, I will say it would be appropriate to call Season 2's protagonist another reflection of Tulip. Alright, so among Season 1's various affirmations of lore regarding the train, one clear distinction made was that it had three types of people on board. The conductor and their assistants, who tend to the train and make sure everything is progressing as it should. The passengers, who come from the normal world and learn to be better, displayed through a number that can go up or down depending on their actions. And denizens, who are inhabitants of the train created to help move the passengers along through either giving them challenges or being their companions. That's the typical order of how the train is supposed to operate at maximum effect efficiency. But what if a denizen decided it wanted to live the life of a passenger instead? I mean, think about it. There are theoretically an infinite number of cars. It shouldn't be out of the question that one might have a denizen unhappy with where they are that wants to see the world only passengers know. And it could make for some thought-provoking conflict, so as a tease for what's to come, Season 1 briefly explored it through the Chrome Car, a part of the train that lets a person's reflection express its own autonomy. And oh boy, Tulips has been waiting to flame her ass for multiple years now with explicit details on why. Which I gotta say, is a really creative method for giving exposition about how Tulip acts without us needing to see it. As obviously, if her reflection is nothing like her, she'd have a couple choice words for how Tulip chooses to live. Plus, outside of that narrative context, the fact that Mirror Tulip has had to reflect someone else she isn't for her entire life or face extermination really endears us to her character in a short time frame. So having the second season be about her personal struggle for identity and freedom isn't hard to imagine at all. It was properly foreshadowed as a returning plot point before the last story's ending, so it feels natural that since Tulip's story is finished, it only makes sense to continue on with her mirror self. As we've already come to know, she has plenty to offer theming-wise, but a singular character fixing their issues an Infinity Train season does not make. So early on, she gets her own companion character, a passenger by the name of Jesse, who at first seems to serve a similar purpose to Atticus and one one but we soon come to see that isn't the case when the show reiterates to us that, well, He's a passenger, and MT is just a denizen. He wasn't created for the purpose of getting MT through her own issues, since one one doesn't recognize her as someone that needs her issues solved. Wanting to live freely without the mirror police on her back isn't a priority. She's supposed to be another part of the train, a prop to gauge morality as Jesse continues his own journey. On the other side, though, when looking at it on a meta level, we, the audience, view MT as the main character of the season that clearly has her own problems to work through, so in traveling along with Jesse, who has his own shortcomings, we think of it less as a commensal relationship, where the companions just come along for the sake of the protagonist's benefit, and more of a symbiotic exchange. Or as the normies would say, a mutual friendship. They're two bros hanging out, watching each other's backs and fixing each other's problems. Jesse to learn he should stand up for himself instead of going with the flow, and MT to come along with once his number reaches zero, escaping the confines of the train and living her own life. However, the train doesn't see that. It only notices MT helping Jesse, so it thinks she's 
doing her job the way she should, and in a way, that's true. MT might have a goal, and she forms a connection with Jesse that allows her to open up, but compared to M, she didn't go through nearly as much of a change. Jesse went through and learned something, MT, emotionally and philosophically speaking, remained nearly the same. Technically, at least when you remove all the nuance, she was just along for the ride. And what I love about this idea is that, unless you were paying super close attention during the season, this detail is only something you notice in retrospect when other characters spell it out. She served the function denizens are meant to perform as she attempted to be her own person, so in light of this, it gets you to wonder, does she have autonomy or is she predetermined to do as the train wants her to? And of course, we know that based on her actions, the answer is yes, she does have autonomy, but for characters that are either pushing a certain agenda or have difficulty thinking outside of black and white terms, they're not going to pick up on that subtlety, whether unintentionally or maliciously. Really, it takes an unbiased human voice to break through the noise of it all and see MT, or as she eventually chooses to go by Lake, for who she is. And that voice comes from who else but Jesse, the one person that actually got to experience what she was like and know intrinsically that she was more than a companion, more than a reflection, more than a fugitive. She's his friend, as well as an independent person with her own flaws, personality traits, eccentricities, and mannerisms. And she deserves to have the same kind of happiness, the kind of life that he does, even if she wasn't originally created or spawned into existence with that purpose predefined. She should have the choice as a living, breathing, thinking being that's unhappy where she is to change that. It doesn't have to go much further, just basic human understanding and compassion for their fellow man. And thankfully, Jesse gives her that opportunity, finding a way to bring Lake along with him to the real world where, whether or not she has any kind of plan to go off of, she finally has a life that she can do anything with. And that's enough. If there was one thing Season 2 made clear through its deviation in subject matter and purpose from the first, it was this. Infinity Train isn't going to be a typical anthology going from story to story with a regular passenger that wakes up on the train, meets companions, learns something about the train, finds the answer, cycle, rinse, repeat. 100% the series could have been if it wanted to and worked equally as well. Season 1 is a prime example of them using the formula properly, but that's not what the series is aiming for, it wants to go higher. Season 1 just set up the meta. It created the base model, so now the showrunners want to deconstruct it with exceptions to the rules. See what inventive new spins they can come up with by picking apart the vague standards that they created. First it was Lake, the denizen that wanted to be something more, longing for freedom away from the train. And here in Season 3, we're given the exact opposite with the Apex, a group of kids and teens that, rather than taking the help of denizens, learning the reason why they were brought there in the first place and growing as people, have chosen to embrace the train's escapist dreamland element as their right, completely forgetting their previous lives to have as much fun as they want. Basically, it's an extremist group where Lord of the Flies has been voluntarily applied to the train system, and that really isn't all too exaggerated, seeing as none of the kids actually know how numbers work, not even the leaders. They're completely in the dark about what they're supposed to do, but they know, through trial and error, that they can pretty much act however they want as long as they avoid certain dangers. So they exploit that, treating the denizens with complete disregard, believing they're nothing but vessels for their amusement, and if it causes their numbers to grow, that must mean they're doing good. Plus, hey, new passengers, especially kids, have a limited understanding of the train that scares them, and the Apex presents a lifestyle that favors freedom from consequence or guilt, so it's no wonder they found it appealing. It's a system that allows their members to sink further into depravity, in turn straying away from or ignoring the personal issues they were meant to resolve, but who cares about fixing their shit when they can forget instead? Why learn when you could not? It's about as counterproductive to the meaning of the train as you could imagine, and there's no better way for me to explain how much of a problem it is than through the leaders, Grace and Simon, who are without a doubt the most complex protagonists we've gotten so far, considering that for once, they're just straight up bad people. Like, up to this point, we've undoubtedly been given leads that were flawed and needed to overcome serious adversity, seeing as that's the whole point of the train in the first place, but Tulip, Jesse, Lake? They were all people that didn't lean into their negative qualities and only revealed them during moments of stress or trauma, usually unintentionally. They were regular, honest people who happened to have unaddressed issues eating away at them without proper acknowledgement, so the train forced them to figure out and confront those issues, whether they initially noticed them or not, so they could hopefully return to the regular world better off than they were before. Grace and Simon? 
throw that idea out the window. They've determined that getting their numbers higher is a marker of strength, so they intentionally act as bad as possible with zero remorse, and in turn, it's made them defined by the characteristics they were supposed to figure out were toxic to their mental health. Grace more so than Simon. As she's enraptured herself in a cloak of lies and manipulation so she doesn't have to question her own values. I mean, notice the age of everyone around her and Simon. They're super young, as the Apex doesn't trust adult passengers, and while it's never directly spelled out why, it's easy to see that there's a reason. Older passengers would be more likely to question the Apex's values, not taking as easily to manipulation using fear and lack of understanding. So, as the creator of the rules and guidelines for the Apex, Grace most likely removed them from the equation to not deal with the headache, putting her efforts into being good with children who look up to her for being older, smarter, wiser, etc. It's all about creating an environment she has full control over that helps her feel confident in herself, as when Grace was a child she lacked confidence or a sense of freedom due to her under-supportive, rich parents. So she would lie to get what she wanted and fake courage for the sake of attention. That's what the train originally brought her aboard to fix, but Grace felt more comfortable lying to herself and others, so she did the exact opposite, faking it till she made it. But the thing about lies is that they catch up if you aren't careful, and for Grace, someone whose whole world and identity was built on the back of lies, all it took for that world to fall apart was by meeting someone that emotionally demonstrated she was wrong. And I say emotionally because proving she was wrong with examples and evidence wouldn't be enough. She could always backtrack and plug her ears to pretend she didn't hear it or say it was a lie. But if a character could show Grace was wrong by hitting her in her heart instead of her brain, she wouldn't be able to ignore it like she does everything else, as we see when she comes across a six-year-old girl with a gorilla for her companion, Hazel, who, from a glance, is everything Grace could hope for in a new member of the Apex. She's young, assertive, charming, but there's one problem. She turns out to be a denizen, and, as you may recall, Grace has built up the Apex as a group that doesn't care about denizens and sees them as playthings to mess around with or destroy, so forming any attachment to them is a big no but she does. So on its own, that should tell Grace all she needs to know about the life she's led up to now, but she can't admit it. Grace doesn't have the capacity to say that she was wrong, because if that truth isn't true, then what else has she been wrong about? How deeply has she missed the point all this time? It's a question that she isn't willing to confront, so with nowhere to go but down, she keeps digging a hole. She lies about Hazel's true identity to Simon, pretends she didn't know when Hazel is discovered, pretends she's looking out for Hazel's best interest, but it's all wrong and she knows it. Everything Grace does is to protect herself or the image she's created as leader of the Apex, and it's only when she finally admits that that's the case, after having lost everything, that she can finally begin the path to redemption for herself and the rest of the kids that she's led astray. Or I guess I should say, almost the rest, since one was too far gone to be saved, highlighting that, though the two were close friends, they weren't as similar as they may have thought. On one hand, Grace used her insecurities and negative qualities as a source of strength when forming the Apex, building her personality and motives around deceit. While on the other, Simon chose to bury his deep within to avoid them, but just the same as Grace's manipulative tendencies grew with time, so did Simon's issues. And you know, contrary to Grace, we never get a flashback or deeper understanding of how Simon arrived as a passenger in the first place, but from his turmoil and breakdowns, it's not too difficult to piece together that it had something to do with deep seated dependency on others, causing a lack of emotional stability when his high expectations started falling through. It happened with his companion when she accidentally abandoned him, leaving Simon with a hatred of all denizens afterwards, and it happens in the present when, after spending years basically relying on Grace to tell him what to think and how to act, she starts getting angry at him for doing what she once encouraged him to. He preaches the values of the Apex, she shuts him down. He kills a denizen that was making things difficult, she gets furious and pulls rank to condemn him. It's all too much for Simon to handle without explanation, and once he sees that Grace lies to him about Hazel, he rationalizes it by believing that she's been manipulated to turn against him by the others. It's actually nearly an exact parallel to Grace denying that she was wrong and continuing to lie so she could avoid taking accountability, but... Unlike her, Simon's not able to reflect and admit that all he's believed in for so long was a lie, so he just does to Grace what he did for denizens and completely writes her off as worthy of being destroyed, fully giving in to his emotions and becoming the prime example of what the train wanted to prevent. An attached, broken person that couldn't see the error of their ways and sunk too far for anyone to reach them, no matter the act. He's what Amelia could have become if Tulip didn't stop her. And so, he makes for a perfectly disturbed, tragic antagonist in the finale, serving as a narrative 
with opposite to Grace, who's accepted the meaning of the train and gets saved for wanting to change, whereas Simon rejects that meaning in favor of ignoring the signs and ends up dead. Representing the split between letting your negative traits consume you and realizing you have a problem that needs fixing. A bittersweet ending to a powerful season that explains so much about the meaning of numbers and still left plenty of questions to be theorized about leading into... Hmm... Okay, I'm gonna be honest. It's a bit difficult for me to talk about this season from an unbiased perspective. Not that it's too complex or hard to interpret or super divisive. It isn't. As far as Infinity Train seasons go, it's got a theme that's easier to take apart than most. It's just... This isn't just another season, it's the ending of the entire series, and though I can see some merit in the story as a detached viewing unto itself, I hate looking at it as an ending, since it's so obvious that wasn't the intention. And it's not woven into the subtext in a subtle way you wouldn't notice if you were watching casually either. Book 4 is very much a middle-of-the-road type installment that's primarily about toying with a fun concept, in this case the idea of two passengers sharing one number, and setting up lore for the future with what basically equates to a side story set before the events of the first season. Which would be perfectly fine if it was just that, but it wasn't. It was the finale. And when you take that tidbit into consideration knowing there's nothing after, it leaves Book 4 feeling all the less finished as its own thing and more like a puzzle with half the pieces missing. Presumably, there was a lot of content that got scrapped when the series was cancelled, as the writers originally envisioned it continuing on for eight seasons, befitting of how the infinity symbol is the sideways eight. But then HBO rejected the concept for Season 5, a movie focusing on Amelia's takeover of the train, for not having a quote-unquote child entry point. Since Amelia is old, and children can't relate to old people, Johnny Brav who? Sam who, Rijack? Regular shit who? What are those? You sound fucking stupid. <sighs> but yeah, with all that on the cutting room floor, season four, more than anything, reminds me a lot of a Gretzko's final season that was released a couple months back. It's not really connected to any parts of the show that came before, the plot it does follow is serviceable, but nowhere near what you'd expect for a series finale. It doesn't quite push boundaries in the same way seasons before it did. Then, once it's finished, you're left thinking, wait, that was the end? I, I barely felt like we started. But it's over. The show's been cancelled before there was any chance of a satisfying conclusion, so we gotta live with it. And okay, I'm making season 4 sound bad with these comparisons, but by regular cartoon standards, it's still pretty good. Way better than a Gretzko's ending, that's for sure. It's more so like humans when compared to the rest of Gorillaz. It's easily the worst the band has done in their vast collection of amazing LPs, but you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone that listened to it and said, That was an objectively terrible album. I'm shocked and appalled. It's good. Not great. That's how I feel about IT Season 4. It was an exploration of the friendship between two Asian-Canadian teens figuring out their paths in life, choosing between what'll make them happy or what their families want, and it was perfectly fine. My only major gripe, aside from a couple abrupt revelations and minorly annoying characters, was with the pacing. As early episodes in the season felt meandering and pointless, while ones at the end were packed tight with conflict in a way that I feel would have been more satisfying if it was spread out properly, but that's just me rambling. It was a solid 6.5 out of 10 season with likable pro tags that I could personally relate to as someone that's been in the same situation more or less, and it was cool to see that numbers can reach zero and then regress if the person doesn't quite understand the lesson. I thought that was an interesting touch, but aside from that, for season 4, I don't have that much to say for it as a solo piece. I just get bummed out watching it since I like to think about what more could have come if executives saw creator Owen Dennis' vision and let him pursue it, but I guess getting four seasons of Infinity Train in the first place place was already a miracle on its own. I hate to repeat myself here, but have you seen some of the shit they got away with? We saw multiple characters agonizingly die on screen in brutal ways. We got a bunch of interconnected miniseries with mature themes relating to divorce, identity, and choice. With the current climate of streaming services and how shitty most of them are to animation, I doubt we're going to get anything close to similar in children's hell adult cartoon media for a while. So for now, let's all just appreciate what was made, turn on our VPNs, and engage in some morally righteous yo ho ho and if you catch my drift. Cause hey, if HBO Max wants to get rid of it, that doesn't mean we have to stop watching or talking about Infinity Train. I've been Just Stop, you've been in a train car this whole time, you stupid idiots. Hope you enjoyed the video, and peace out.